Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld adventure in the Cold Bog with the Cult of Jinx. Last time we left off after sending our two latest recruits, Wyatt and Light, on a quest for the mysterious Red Hawk relic. To be honest though, it was all Light who used his psychic abilities to full effect, while our other main psychaster Freya did something similar back home in the village of Liviana, using her Berserk Pulse ability to fend off a group of breaching raiders. Now, at the end of the episode, we also had another Gauranlin pot sprout on the map, and as you can see here, with Coco harvesting it, this one actually dropped two Gauranlin seeds. Yes, that is possible because of her ridiculously high plant skill, and it means that we can now plant not one, but two new lovely trees. First of all though, it is time to give out yet another name, yes, another Yak has been born. So, as always, chosen from the list of patron supporters in the naming rights tier and above, this one will be named Abdizor, Abdizor, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Either way, congratulations and welcome to the colony, you are now Yak number 10, and I think with that we may have reached our limit. Before we do anything drastic though, let's first get those Gauranlin trees planted. The first one here brings our ideology development points up to 10, and the second one, planted by Thoraya, gets us to 11. Now the big question is of course who to give these to, as most of our colonists already have tree connections, and with the first tree here we are going with Jekna, who so far has mostly been focused on doing artwork, but we have turned most of the free marble blocks on the map into statues already, and thanks to a bad back and some unfortunate injuries, Jekna is actually very slow moving, so it might actually benefit her to just stand near the tree and take care of that, which in turn will this time produce some hauler dryads, just so we have a bit of help carrying stuff around the base. Tree number two, meanwhile, will go to our melee specialist Wyatt. Apart from stabbing people, he doesn't really have that much to do in the village. So with this tree, we will once again help out our food supply a bit and produce some berries. Considering the number of people and animals that we have, I think that's a good idea. For the rest of the afternoon then, we can watch as we get ready for that monument quest we received last episode. Yes, we need quite a bit of granite for that, while Jekna and her plan skill of 2 get started pruning. Yes, as you can see, she would be much better suited making more artwork, even just out of wood. And don't worry, we will have her continue to do that soon. For now though, considering that she herself is fairly limited in her movement range, I think it's best to get at least a few haulers going to help us out. On to the aforementioned drastic things then, as it is time to say goodbye to our yak bull Raymond. I think the birthing spree has gone on for long enough and of course animal handler Squeaks will take care of this herself. Not only will this give us some much needed meat during these winter days, but it also gets rid of the only mature male animal in the herd, so we shouldn't see any new offspring for at least some time. And yes, I know you can also castrate animals now, but that would hardly feed anyone. A short while later then, six of our colonists are hit with what is actually a very interesting disease, as Squigs, Took, Freya, Spex, Redini and Kevin all come down with sensory mechanites. And this disease is interesting because it's not just penalties. As a matter of fact, the mechanites actually improve sight, hearing, talking and manipulation. They also increase our colonists' pain levels, which considering our pain is virtue meme might actually be a good thing. The only real downside is the increased need for sleep, as well as the relatively long time this disease will last, as we will very likely be stuck with it for at least 20 to 30 days. And during that time frame we do also want to treat our patients. It's not like the disease is going to kill anyone, but if we allow it to progress too far, then the pain is going to become a bit too much even for our colonists. The consciousness penalties will just be a bit too much to handle, not to mention that tiredness will also increase even further. So while I'm definitely not complaining about it, I would like to keep it in the mild stages if possible, which will of course put a bit of a strain on our medical supplies. Still, with a medical skill of 13, Kevin is more than capable of tending to everyone, including himself. Actually, the improved sight and manipulation from the Mechanites even improves his ability to do so. Our Psycasters, meanwhile, actually also benefit from the increased pain levels, as those have a direct influence on how quickly neural heat is recovered. Unfortunately, in this case, though, our Super Psycaster Light has not gotten infected. So all in all, I would say things are going well so far and in the evening they get even better, as a trade caravan from Anum arrives. Now all by itself, that's nothing out of the ordinary. However, this here is the faction that we need to ally ourselves with to get the first part of the Arconexus map, and I had actually already planned some more creative ways to achieve that. Now though, it looks like it might not need to come to that. 
So then, as the caravan arrives in the village, here is what we're going to do. Instead of just trading with them, we are switching over to the gift tab, where, as you can see, we can exchange some of our goods or animals for relationship increases. Thanks to a couple of Neuroquakes, our relationship with this faction currently sits at a minus 6. To make them our allies, we need to get up to a plus 75, so let's get rid of a few things. First things first, yes, sadly, we have to say goodbye to a few more male animals, our two yaks, Martin and Marine Morelt, as well as Muffalo's Lorps and Tap. One male should be enough to breed with all the females we still have, and especially in the case of the yaks, the males don't give milk either, so I think this is the best way to go to get what we need. Especially since, as you can see, we don't really have that many other options, which we're not already using, as we are also giving away all of our insect jelly, components, advanced components and luciferium, as well as two thrombohorns, a joywire and the no longer needed terror sculpture. All of that will improve our faction relations by plus 77, so let's confirm, and please don't ask me how the math works here, as we technically just received a plus 79 increase. Now, that brings us very close to being allies, but not quite there yet, so it's a good thing that you also receive a plus one relationship bonus for every 500 silver traded. And these guys actually have a few things that we want, particularly a Doomsday Rocket Launcher and a Circadian Half Cycler. To get both, we are selling all of our gold, another Thrombohorn and three units of Glitter World Medicine, not to mention that we're also using pretty much all of our available silver, but all of that should be enough to push us over the limit and finally make us allies. And there we go, we have accomplished what I honestly did not think we would accomplish this quickly. We are now allied with the faction holding the first piece of the Arconexus map, and so all we need to do at this point to obtain that map is to get our colony wealth up to 200,000 silver. Of course, we also don't want to lose our alliance, but that does not happen as soon as we drop below 75. In fact, we could push things down back to zero, and only then would we become neutral again. To celebrate our alliance, Randy then also has a Psychic Sooth for us in store, and so with the mood of all of Liviana's females boosted, we begin a new day. And we actually want to hurry doing so, because Wyatt here has a creativity inspiration that expires soon, and with a crafting skill of 10, he might actually produce something worthwhile. Okay, I had not expected that, but Wyatt has just created a legendary quality Steel Guardian helmet. Because of time restrictions, this was basically the only option. And with a sharp armor rating of roughly 90%, about that of a recon helmet, I think he has now earned the right to wear that himself. Armando, meanwhile, gets the old one and with that now also drops the face mask. Although, shortly after, we can see him heading to the hospital. Yes, we bought that circadian half cycler specifically for him. What this brain implant actually does is it completely removes Armando's need for sleep, albeit at the price of a 15% consciousness penalty. And that is also why it is so very well suited for our level 19 craftsman here. The consciousness penalty has no effect on the quality of the items he makes, and even though it will now take just a little while longer to make them, that time increase is more than made up for by the fact that he now stays up all day, every day. For now though, with the procedure successfully completed, Armando will take just a few hours of sedated rest, although as night sets across the swamp, Armando is already back on his feet. On the next morning then, we begin with a small construction project around our tree temple, as temperatures inside are getting a bit too much on the low side, endangering our devil strand mushrooms. So wherever the swampy terrain permits it, we are now erecting a second layer of wall, and we have also constructed a second door just to keep the warmth inside a bit longer. In the afternoon then, Maniac experiences a shoot frenzy and we are actually also visited by yet another caravan, this one a tribal war merchant who does not have too much to offer, but we can sell a bunch of stuff to them, mostly some old weapons and clothing items, and in exchange obtain an excellent quality great bow as well as some silver. By now though, I think the Cult of Jinx has learned a lot about the stopping power of automatic weapons, so should we be able to obtain a few more, that would of course be ideal. Another inspiration then strikes at night, with Light receiving a taming inspiration. However, his taming skill is just so low that I don't think we'll be able to put that to good use. On the temperature front, meanwhile, we are also putting up a few extra torches inside of our tree temple. The extra walls have had only a minor effect. This here should now make sure that our Devil Strand does not die, which would definitely be tragic, considering that we are about three quarters through the growing period. For some reason, our tribal caravan also appears to have left a good amount of pemmican, which we will of course gladly take, even though at the moment we actually have a lot of success hunting. The blood splatters on the right here might be a good indicator of that. 
A few hours later, we are also informed that the Anima Tree is ready for another linking ritual. And with three level 6 Psycasters already in our ranks, it is time for someone new. And I think that person is going to be our brawler Wyatt. Yes, he is a proficient melee fighter, but that does not mean that we need to rush him into danger needlessly. So giving him two or three useful Psycasts might be a good way to go. With the connection ritual still underway, we then also receive an interesting quest here, and once again I would like to hear what you guys think about it. We would be accepting a volcanic winter for 16 days, meaning lower light levels and lower temperatures, which would of course affect our ability to grow crops. Accepting it in the middle of winter here could actually also push temperatures so low that we end up with no way to effectively shield ourselves, but we do have 7 days to make a decision and by that we should almost be in spring. The rewards then are nothing crazy, but a legendary great bow or a psychic shock lance could be useful. So again, let me know what you think. I am currently leaning more towards not accepting it, but I'm very open to hear your thoughts. Moving on then, the linking ritual for Wyatt completes and we can choose one of three randomly selected psychasts. And with the one that is presented to us here, I think stun is the way to go. Both stun and burden are very useful, but in melee combat stun actually completely stops an enemy from attacking you, allowing you to get away, while burden only slows them down, which does not necessarily break the engagement. The night then passes by uneventfully, and on the next morning it is mission time. Our quest for the Plasma Sword Redhawk continues. This time we need to send out 10 colonists on a tomb raiding quest. So let's call in the shuttle here and select our adventurers. And with 15 people in our village, it might just be easier to tell you who stays home. That would be Specs, just in case we need another Neuroquake to defend against the large raid. Also Squigs, who has both her hands full with all of our animals as well as Armando, who can continue to craft, Kevin, who is really not useful in combat at all, and also Plant Specialist Coco, simply because we could only take 10. After a few hours of travel, the shuttle then arrives at its destination and we are looking at a fairly large complex here. We have roughly four and a half days to explore it before some raiders will arrive, but of course we plan to be out of here by then. So, using Super Psycaster Light, we will now start exploring. He has the Skip Psycast and should be able to get out of Dodge quickly, should the situation call for it. Before we properly kick things off, though, we already received the next part of the Red Hawk hunt. It is once again a space drone hack. I think we completed one already for the Horn of Edmo. I think this should be doable, but let's focus on the here now. The first room does not reveal too much, just a hermetic crate and no dangers. And we will actually fully map out the complex first and not touch anything, just so we minimize our chances of running into any nasty surprises. The second room then holds the first terminal, but still nothing dangerous in sight. That changes slightly though as we open door number 3. Yes, we definitely do not want to wake up these guys too early. The room on the other side then actually looks similar, also with another terminal and a security crate. So again, we might just want to loop around this one for now. Up next then we discover another lone hermetic crate. An empty room that basically only fulfills the purpose of eventually going up into flames and a completely empty room right next to it. Crossing another entirely empty room then we finally find another security crate and beyond that a room that could be interesting holding an enemy terminal. Who knows, if things go well we might just spawn those in at the end of the mission. For now though let's keep looking around. Light then finds another Hermetic Crate as well as Terminal number 3. And in the last room, Terminal number 4, another Hermetic Crate as well as a comms console. So, time to go to work and of course we want to deal with those insects first. However, we also want to make sure that the place does not burn down while we do that. So Donut and Chutney here are quickly destroying the walls of the rooms with the unstable fuel nodes. Just so that if they blow up, the rooms do not heat up too much and we can still go inside to extinguish the flames. Once that is taken care of, we can then very carefully destroy the wall into the insect room, and we actually want to do that with a single shot weapon like Jackna's Great Bow here. Otherwise, if the wall is destroyed on shot 1 of a 3 burst volley, for example, then shots 2 and 3 might hit the insects and cause them to wake up immediately, which is something that we definitely do not want to happen, as we can now wake them up ourselves with a lovely berserk pulse that should cause pretty much all of them to go aggro. And there we go, this room should now slowly but steadily decimate itself. One single Berserk Pulse will likely not be enough to take care of all the insects, but that's why we have a good amount of firepower stationed outside. From time to time, the occasional bug does make it out, but is quickly killed, and so we are quickly down to the last few stragglers, after which this area of the complex is cleared, and we conveniently also created ourselves another entry. 
And using that entry, we are now pretty much doing the exact same thing in the other insect room. This time we are sneaking light all the way up to the door, but the insects are still sleeping. The berserk pulse then obviously wakes them up, but light is quick to get out of dodge. Once again then, after doing some good damage amongst themselves, the bugs trickle out of the building one by one. This situation here, with two mega spiders coming at us, probably the most interesting moment in this fight. All in all though, I would say that we have solved this first stage of the puzzle beautifully, and so a few seconds later we are indeed informed that no enemies remain. So that means it's now time to start hacking. Thoraya, Light, Maniac and Freya are the four colonists with the highest intellectual scores, so they are now heading for the terminals, while the rest grab a bite to eat and stretch their legs, for now there really isn't too much they can do. Redini, meanwhile, can go around opening chests and crates, and even though we are warned here that doing so will wake up the insects, I'd say we are one step ahead of the game here. Our loot then consists of some luciferium, gold, a few packaged survival meals, a crafting skill trainer, all in all nothing too crazy, but of course we'll gladly take it. Terminal number one is then also quickly hacked, Thoraya is the first to finish the task. One of the downed mega spiders actually also briefly got back up on its feet, but as you can see it's quickly shot down here. The crate right next to it meanwhile only pops out a few bits of silver. Terminal number two is then also quickly hacked, and with that let us actually already prepare for the potential hacking of the enemy terminal, which is located right next to another unstable fuel node, so we are now creating a slightly more direct access point. Terminal number three is then also completed soon after, and with all of our people taking a nap around the comms console, we then receive news of visitors on the home map. Unfortunately though, it's just a single trader who should not have too many valuables. And with light almost finished with the fourth terminal, let us also hack into the supply satellite now. This time the drop pods gift us 21 units of flake. Nothing terribly useful, but Donut will quickly run out to grab it. And with that, all four terminals are hacked and our quest is completed, although we are not leaving just yet. I'm just curious to see what the game actually spawns with the enemy terminal, and if it's too bad, we can still rush into the shuttle and get out of here. This is also why Freya will take care of the hacking, so that she can skip out of dodge. She will need to do that at least once anyway, as the fuel node here will not last long. Okay then, here are our enemies, 30 well-armed pirates, I'm seeing sniper rifles, miniguns, a triple rocket launcher and at least one doomsday. In a straight up firefight that is definitely just a bit too much to handle for us. But maybe with a slightly more creative approach we might have a chance here. Keep in mind that we need to kill only roughly half of them to make them flee, and our enemies have actually brought the tools to achieve that themselves. So after skipping Freya away from the explosion, let's have a sneak up on the enemies here. And yes, I know this is a bit risky, but we are skipping her right in front of them and then drop another berserk pulse. After that, it's time to skip away before the first shots are fired. And while Freya runs away, we can watch the carnage unfold. Okay, so that looked to me like the Doomsday Rocket Launcher. At this point, one third of our enemies has already been eliminated, so let's see if we can't just kill a few more and force them to flee. Lovely, that's one more down, and with light we are now performing the same skip berserk pulse combo. That should get two more people to bash their heads in, the triple rocket launcher guy is not to be seen anywhere. And there we are, that was actually a bit easier than I would have thought. Our enemies are fleeing and we can shoot them down in the process. Keep in mind that this is a great chance to grab a few powerful weapons, so let's see what we can obtain here. Okay, so it looks like unfortunately the guy with the triple rocket launcher will get away, but we can still loot a chain shotgun, a minigun, a few heavy SMGs, and also a sniper rifle from the initial point of attack. And with all of that in hand, as well as with the loot from the ancient complex, let's finally fly back home. That completes the quest and brings us one step closer to finally obtaining another relic. Over the course of the late afternoon then, all remaining bow wielders exchange their bows for proper guns. Thanks to his trigger happy trade, Armando will actually be the one to grab the minigun. If you want to know why, then I highly recommend Francis John's Rimworld ideology series. Suffice it to say that trigger happy and the minigun go along quite nicely. Jekna, with her shooting skill of 16 meanwhile, grabs the sniper rifle. I think the range of that weapon should make up for her limited mobility and overall fragileness. And with that, all ranged fighters in the Cult of Jinx are now fully decked out in modern weaponry. 
And I think, especially with their newfound alliance, the wonders of modern technology are slowly but steadily creeping up on our cultists. Perhaps not enough to completely give up on the nature-bound lifestyle just yet, but we may have just planted the seeds, if you will, for something a bit more modern in the future. For today though, with another night setting across the cold bog, I think we have reached a good point to make the cut. And we actually also have some fan art again this week, this one drawn by Kuji. It depicts that fight against the breaches last time, in which Jekna dropped down just a bit too quickly. So thank you once again for the lovely submission, and if you have any artwork to contribute as well, the best way to send it to me is via email to pete at petecomplete.com. And with that, let's wrap things up for today. So, as always, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.